Hello everyone, my name is Andrew Brankley and welcome to this video on What is Risk? The first installment in my Simple Answer series. This video has been rated novice, which means I've done my very best to make the content accessible to everyone. If you have any questions or comments about the content or use of this video, please comment below or email me directly. Human beings are inherently social creatures. We like to hang out together, we watch each other's YouTube videos. Which is why when someone breaks the law, we have an instinctive reaction to separate and punish them. This leads to many questions in the criminal justice system. For example, how dangerous is this person? Do they need to be incarcerated? How can we rehabilitate them? All these questions fall onto one central topic, risk. To better understand risk, we have to take a psychological approach, examine what's going on in their minds. When we look inside their mind, what do you think risk will look like? In risk, the world is your battlefield. You are the general, leading armies across borders, conquering everything in your path. No, 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 shut it down, people. This is not what I was talking about when I said, find me a good example of risk. I'm not talking about a board game, of course. I'm talking about a psychologically meaningful explanation, something that would help me to explain why people commit crimes. And the first thing I can tell you about risk, besides that it's not a board game, is that it's not just one thing on its own. It's very likely to be several different things, several different risk factors that relate to reoffending. Here are two very useful articles that review risk factors that predict sexual reoffending. You can find links to these articles in the description section below the video. If we go in a step closer, we will be able to identify some of these risk factors. These blue circles represent the risk relevant factors that we should be concerned about. I can't include all of them, but some prominent ones are poor interpersonal functioning, problem solving, and a propensity for rule breaking behavior. All of these contribute towards committing any type of crime. There are also offense specific risk factors. I have also added three red circles, as you can see here, to represent risk that is relevant to sexual offending. These are atypical sexual preferences, sex as a coping strategy, and sexual preoccupation. These types of factors can be present within an individual. The more of them that are present, the more likely that person is to commit an offense. Now that we have an idea of what we are looking for and where to look, the question is how do we know? How do we go about measuring risk? This is actually a really tough question, and I think the best explanation comes by way of a metaphor using the five senses. Now, we use the information collected through sight, smell, hearing, taste, and touch to navigate the world. For example, let's take sight. Arguably our most important sense as we have evolved to rely upon it heavily. Let's say you see an orange fruit and you're thinking of eating it, but then you see another orange fruit and you have to decide which fruit you'd rather have. You might decide to touch one of them and see if one is better or more ripe. As soon as you grab the bottom fruit, you can feel that it's actually made out of plastic. When you grab the top fruit, you can feel that it is real and decide to eat it instead. Now we were able to do this because we coordinated two sources of information. The sensation of touch and the sight of the fruit weren't separate in our minds. They were both coming from the same object. What I'm trying to say is that these arrows are like our senses and correspond to different sources of information about risk. The information we collect may look different, but are actually just different perspectives on the same underlying issues. Let's look at interpersonal functioning as an example. There are at least three different sources of information commonly assessed. The first and most common source is from static factors. These are commonly available sources of information that usually don't require clinical interviewing or testing to identify. For interpersonal functioning, we might see if they have ever had a live-in relationship with an intimate partner, or developmentally, if they were raised by both parents. 
The next source of information is from stable dynamic factors. These are enduring but changeable characteristics of the person. For example, by identifying their social network or their ability to maintain relationships. Acute dynamic factors are current expressions of risky behavior and provide evidence if chronic risk-relevant propensities are currently active and present in the client. An easy interpersonal example would be changes in client's social support network. Taking all of these different sources of information together provides a comprehensive picture of the risk-relevant propensities for crime. This is why in the static family of risk assessment tools for sexual offending, we have three types of tools, the SAC-99R or the SAC-2002R to measure static factors, the STABLE-2007 to measure stable dynamic factors, and the ACUTE-2007 to measure acute dynamic factors. You can imagine someone with significant interpersonal problems that are indicated by never having lived with a lover, having significant problems maintaining stable relationships, and is more likely to experience changes in social supports. Alone, these items may be interesting, but when you bring them together, you can form a clear picture of the client, his problems, and create plans for risk management and intervention. Now, let's change up the examples and talk about why having multiple sources of information can really be helpful. Let's say you have someone with no prior sex offenses. It might lead you to believe that he doesn't have any sex-specific problems. However, after completing a stable 2007 and an acute 2007, you can see clear problems with sexual self-regulation. In this case, the static was just not sensitive to that problem, but with the combination of tools, you can see it is clearly present. I think I've made my point that the static dynamic risk factor distinction may be practical when deciding how and who is going to do an assessment, but not useful when trying to conceptualize the client. Each of these different sources of information provide non-redundant evidence about the same underlying problems. It is no different than saying you have collected information from sight, touch, and hearing to learn about an object in your environment. Moreover, it would be wrong to think we are limited to three avenues to assess risk. A fourth source of information could be identified, for example, biological markers that could further help us understand problems like sex drive and preoccupation that can be present to different degrees in our clients, measured through different sources of information like demographics or behavioral patterns, so that we can make decisions about the amount of danger a client poses to the community and when that individual may finally be safe to return. Well, I hope everyone enjoyed the video. Please feel free to share it for training or teaching purposes. I'm also happy for you to use the video or the slides in your own presentations. I just ask that you reference them accordingly. Please feel free to contact me if you have any questions and comments. If you liked this video, then I hope you check out my other videos and subscribe to my YouTube channel.